Good morning, everybody. I don't know if this would be a marvelous, oh well, yeah, it's a marvelous Monday. We're blessed any way you look at it. God is doing great things. He's in control. And it's another day that God has given us to tell somebody about him. Let's don't waste that opportunity. Somebody comes across their path and they need to know of God's love and mercy. And we can show them the way. So stay tuned. We're going to be looking at, want to know a secret? Once again, good morning on an absolute marvelous Monday. Blessed, we're blessed, we're blessed. It is a great day to be living for Jesus, having him in our heart and the Holy Spirit just leading and guiding. Awesome weekend. God was in the house doing mighty things. His, the, his love and his mercy is just astounding at times. And the great things he's doing with us and through us and like I said, it's another day. He's given us another opportunity to share his love and his mercy and his grace with somebody he'll bring across our path today, whether it's a phone call or grocery shopping, at the service station getting gas. What, there's always an opportunity set before us to share God's love and mercy with somebody. Don't miss those opportunities. Grab on to them and share Share your testimony. Share the love of God. That's our duty. That's what we're called to do. Share his love and his mercy. If we keep quiet, even the rocks may cry out. And I don't want no rock crying out in my place. So let's share loves God. And so today, be looking in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. Want to know a secret. Verse 10 says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content, whatever the need, circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all through him who gives me strength. Want to know a secret? We all love hearing secrets, don't we? There's something about knowing a secret that makes us feel special, privileged to have this information that other people don't know. Some people can't keep a secret. You know, someone comes up to them and says, you want to know a secret? I can tell you, you only promise me one thing. You won't tell anybody else. And so they promise and then immediately go and tell somebody else and say the same thing. I've got a secret. I can tell you, but you've got to promise you won't tell anybody else. Ever done that? Hey, it's okay. It's a secret. When Paul shares with us a secret today that it's okay to share with anyone and everyone you want to. 
So if you're not good at keeping secrets, then this is a great secret to pass along. It's not secret because it's not a secret because it's privileged information. <laughs> it's a secret because so many people don't know it, and if you told them, they wouldn't believe it. It's a secret of contentment. The secret of being content, no matter what your circumstances, that's a pretty good secret, wouldn't you say? So do you want to know a secret? Here we go. If you want to learn the secret of con contentment in all circumstances, the first step is to rejoice in God's provision. Look at the first part of verse 10 with me. I rejoice greatly in the Lord. At last you have renewed your concern for me. Joy has been a common theme throughout this entire letter. And here Paul sounds a note of joy again, this time in response to the gift that the Philippians had sent him in prison. In fact, he says, I rejoice greatly. This is the first time in this letter and the only time in all his letter that Paul adds the word greatly to his rejoicing. The Philippians' gift of financial support lifted his heart and filled him with great joy. But notice that Paul is rejoicing not simply in the gift itself, but he's rejoicing in the Lord. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. The gift represented their friendship with him and their partnership in the gospel with Paul. Paul was glad to receive the gift and was thankful to the Philippians, but he recognized this was only God's provision in his life. And so he greatly rejoiced in the Lord. Your first step to learning the secret contentment is rejoice in God's provision. This starts by acknowledging that everything you have comes from God. Yes, you work hard for your paycheck, but who provides you with health, the skills, and the opportunity for work? It all comes from the Lord. Everything you have comes from God. And those times when you're in need and either your church or your family or friends come through for you, yes, thank those for your help. But also recognize that whatever you receive, you received it from the Lord. Now you may be wondering about Paul's phrase in verse 10 where it says, At last you renewed your concern for me. At first it almost sounds like he's scolding the Philippians, but... He didn't, they didn't help him any sooner as if he was saying, finally, you sent me something. It's about time. Now, there had actually been a 10-year gap since they had first helped Paul financially, and I think Paul realized that they might take it the wrong way if he clarif if he did. So he clarifies what he means with the verse 10. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Paul is not upset with them. He's not implying that they should have helped sooner. He makes it clear that he knows that they had been concerned for him all along. Their heart was there for them. They just did not have the opportunity to show it. They would have loved to help him, but it was out of their control and therefore not their fault. And so Paul reassures them so they will not feel bad about the past, but he rejoices greatly in the Lord because they have met his needs in this present time. That is one of the most wonderful things about Christian giving. There's a blessing to the giver as we reach out in love and care for someone else, and there's a blessing to the one who receives as they receive help in their time of need. And then there is praise to God because he is the only one who ultimately provides for all our needs. That is the first lesson in learning the secret of contentment. Rejoice in God's provision for you. The second step to learning the secret of contentment is this. Be content in whatever your circumstances. Look at verse 11 where Paul writes, I am not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances Paul is careful once again to clarify his motives in bringing up their gift to him. The whole area of giving can be tricky at times, and sometimes people can be sneaky in their motives when it comes to expressing thanks for certain gifts. 
For example, grandma comes and visits grandkids and they tell her, thank you, grandma, so much for getting us ice cream last time you were here. That was the absolute best ice cream. We really, really, really love ice cream. You don't need a psychology degree to figure out where this conversation is going. Paul wants the Philippians to know that he appreciates their gift, but he also doesn't want them to get the wrong idea. So he qualifies his first statement of joy. He tells them he is not bringing this up because he's in need. He is in need, but that is not the reason he is bringing this up. The reason Paul can say this is because he had learned to be content whatever the circumstances. The word translated content here is a word that speaks of self-sufficiency. It was a very important word for a group called the Stoics in that time. The Stoics took well, a stoic, stoical lot, view of life where they were determined to let nothing affect their emotions. They were fiercely independent and refused to be disturbed no matter what the circumstances. The Stoic philosopher Seneca summed up Stoicism well when he wrote, The happy man is content with his present lot, <laughs> no matter what it is, and is reconciled to his circumstances. So it is that Paul, so what is it Paul is talking about here? He's telling us, should we all be Stoics? Far from it. Christian contentment might look like Stoicism from a distance, but you get a little closer and you can see they are miles apart. Stoicism was marked by indifference. Christian contentment is marked by joy. Stoicism is fatalistic. Christian contentment trusts in wise and loving God. The Stoic seems to be independent and self-sufficient. The Christian seeks to be dependent on God. Christian contentment does not mean you simply accept your lot, whatever the circumstances. You can certainly work to change a bad situation. And you should always seek to improve yourself. A good example of this is found in 1 Corinthians 7, where Paul is instructing slaves who have become Christians. He writes... Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. There's Christian contentment. Although you can gain your freedom, do so. There's permission to work to improve your circumstances. We need to make sure we don't mistake Christian contentment for personal laziness or a lack of godly ambition. Are you in a bad situation? Pray about it. Work to change it. Are you lacking in Christian character? Ask God to help you become more like Christ. Are you struggling with finances or illness? Do what you can to change your circumstances. But in the interim, while you're waiting for desired change, trust God with your circumstances and seek to honor him in all your circumstances. God has good things to teach you in this difficult time, and you want to make sure you don't miss his lessons for you. So... Does Paul really mean that he's content in whatever the circumstances, or is he exaggerating here? Just in case you think he might not really mean what he says, Paul goes on and describes his own experience. Look at verse 12. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed, hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Paul had lived on both sides of the spectrum. He had experienced times of excruciating need and experienced times of plenty. And he had learned the secret of being content in both situations. Paul didn't seek satisfaction in material things when he didn't have them. He didn't find satisfaction in material things when he had them. We're all familiar with being discontent when we have little, but discontentment is also a problem for people who have much. Here are some temptations you may face during season when plenty. Number one, the temptation to find your satisfaction in things rather than God. Number two, the temptation to take pride in your possessions. Number three, the temptation to be greedy for more. Number four, the temptation to worry about losing the things you have gained. As Stephen Fowle puts it, abundance simply shifts when focused from getting things to keeping the things one has. 
Paul learned to be content in all his circumstances because the contentment was not dependent on his circumstances. Paul told the Philippians not to worry about anything, and now he models that for them with his attitude of Christian contentment. Contentment doesn't come naturally to any of us, and this is why Paul says it's something we need to learn. It's a wonderful secret, but most of us are not ready for it. It takes time, maturity, wisdom to come to that place where we say with Paul, I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. This is the second step to learning. So you be content, whatever your circumstances. So far, we've looked at two steps. Rejoice in God's provision. Be content, whatever your circumstances. And then the third step, learn the secret of contentment is this. Look to Christ for your strength. We see this in verse 13. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. This is one of the most popular verses in the Bible. You see it on posters, T-shirts, coffee mugs, bumper stickers. It consistently rakes in the top ten of people's favorite verses. And it should be. It's a wonderful verse. One you know, I often turn to for encouragement and strength. Unfortunately, one of the most misapplied verses in the Bible. Many people read this verse apart from its context and apart from the full scope of of scripture and misrepresent it to mean I can do anything I want through him who gives me strength. And so the person who wants a new car but can't afford the payments goes ahead and buys something they really can't afford and saying, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Or the student who never studied tries to cover for his negligence by going to the test saying, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Sometimes prosperity preachers will quote this verse to tell you that you can do anything you want because I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Fortunately, this verse does not say I can do or I get anything I want because we all are pretty selfish people. And that would create a nightmare in this world. No, it's far better promise in the context, which is simply this. No matter what circumstances, no matter what trials I may face, no matter how difficult the road ahead God will give me the strength to make it through. Whether in need or in plenty, whether hungry, well-fed, I can handle everything through whom he gives me the strength. And so the promise is not that I can do anything I want, but rather I can do everything God calls me to do through him who gives me the strength. The secret to contentment is not self-sufficiency, but Christ's sufficiency. The strength I need does not come from within, but from without. When I am weak, then I am strong. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. That's the third step in learning the secret of contentment. Look to Christ for your strength. And so Philippians 4 teaches us three very important steps to learning the secret of contentment. Rejoice in God's provision. Be content whatever your circumstances Look to Christ for your strength. Because when it comes right down to it, the secret of contentment is living for Jesus. You cannot be happy without Christ, and if you are not happy with Christ, nothing will make you happy. You were made to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you do not have Christ, you will try everything to fill your life with things that cannot satisfy. And if you are a Christian and you are not happy with Christ, then I don't know anything that's going to make you happy. Jesus Christ will fulfill everything we need in our life. Spiritual, financial, physical, whatever the need may be, it will be supplied, but it will be supplied in his timing. His timing is so much more important than ours as we wait upon the Lord will renew our strength. It's a time to wait on him and seek his guidance and direction and what he'd have us to be doing. That's where the true contentment comes in, is waiting on him, seeking him, listening to that still, still small voice. Like Elijah, he didn't hear him in the earthquake, he didn't hear him in the wind. 
he heard the voice of God in that still, small voice. Listen, seek him. Be in your prayer closet. Oh, he loves to hear your voice. But you've got to slow down and take time and listen for his voice. You will find contentment in Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you and praise you, Lord. I thank you, God, that we can find contentment in you. Through you, all things are possible. And through you, you will give us the strength we need to face the things that have come against us. Father, we know that Satan is real and he's trying to destroy us. He wants to destroy our families. He wants to destroy this church. Father, we stand on your word. Know that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So, Father, we just ask you for a peace that surpasses understanding. Be with us through this week. God, give us direction. I know there will be opportunities to share your love and mercy. Help us, Father. Give us the strength we need to do what you'd have us to do. We'll give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, it's a great day. It's uh, They're talking about it getting a little chilly again. I don't know about you, but I like the warmer weather. But, you know, it is what it is, and we'll just make it through with God's help. Hey. Have a great day, a great week. You're, you're such a blessing to me and this church, your faithfulness and the wonderful things God's doing. And so, you know, like I say, the lights are still on at the lighthouse. You're going to make it with Jesus. Be blessed because you're a blessing. Have a great day.